Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, outer space. 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 I hope you enjoy. Story number one, Flagship, written by Sinchi Dev. They took the humans three cycles to beat the Zylonites, two cycles to beat the Hulnar, and one cycle to beat the Olnir. The intergalactic community was scared, but not as scared as they should have been. The humans then moved against the Prohal and annihilated them in seven seconds. The intergalactic community was now terrified. Now, this was an appropriate response to human capabilities. The intergalactic community then proceeded to study humans with all their resources. Such a level of investment produced a true answer. Humans evolve through conflict. Any conflict humans are in gives humans new knowledge, new tactics, and new weapons. A terrifying ability, to say the least. This is bad enough as it was, but then the galactic community discovered something. Humans had now unrestricted access to the singularity at the center of the galaxy, and they were using it. What could humans do with all their power was something that took many knights of the highest ranks in the galactic community. After debating it for many cycles, they calculated that humans didn't have enough resources to fight all of them, and their best course of action was to eliminate the Violectia and everything inside. A human would realize the mistake in this idea, but they weren't humans. The coordinated effort was the biggest one ever seen in history. The combined armadas of 1,358 Xeno races, the entirety of the intergalactic community reunited at a specified coordinates. The combined armadas were so many that they had a gravitational pull. They all had their objectives locked in, but before they could launch the attack, their senses went crazy. The Violacteer's singularity started to generate insane amounts of energy. Gravitational sensors gave readings of positive and negative gravity at the same time. Some of them even broke. The intergalactic community armada was thrown into absolute chaos. Some of the soldiers present that day would later claim that they could feel reality itself breaking. Believers lost faith. Non-believers started to pray. Some killed themselves. They all feared the power of the humans, but then... Silence. Darkness. And the Via Lactea was no more. The intergalactic community armada was confused to the maximum. They couldn't understand what had happened. Tentatively, the bravest races moved towards where their targets were supposed to be. But they found nothing. They found less than nothing. No radiation, no gravity pull, no residual energy. It looked as any dead zone of deep space would look like. No traces of the scariest species of the universe. After spending many cycles making sure that they wouldn't miss anything, they finally declared humanity gone for good, and they all returned to their systems. And for a while, they were happy, and they were relieved that the humans were gone, and for a while, they wouldn't notice some stars missing in their sky. How could they? Those stars were millions of light years away. And for a while, they celebrated humanity's fall. And for a while, they wouldn't notice the lack of gravitational pull from the galaxies from the edge of the universe. How could they? Those galaxies were billions of light years away. And after their celebrations, they tried to contact each other. But a group was missing. The Xenos from Andromeda. They could still see them. But that was Andromeda as it looked millions of years ago. And one not responding was Andromeda from now. They felt fear again. And the smartest races sent people to investigate. They would have preferred to find corpses, nuked planets, or black holes. But they found something way worse. Nothing. Just like the Via Lectia. No signs of Andromeda ever existing there. The intergalactic community was again scared beyond belief. They scanned all of their territories and the territories near them. The only ones who detected something were the Zolmaz. Among the older species, the Zalmas lived near enough to the edge of the universe to detect the change. One asteroid was supposed to crash into one moon of an exoplanet within their territory. Instead, it missed by several moons' worth of distance. So they tracked its trajectory and again found 
nothing. One hundred and twenty-six cycles of study later, and they kept finding nothing. No galaxies at the edge of the universe. Nothing. Just nothing. If they weren't scared enough, twenty-three cycles later, something happened that made many think of their respective apocalypse. Someone saw the violetia in the sky at one other side of the universe. It was an irrefutable truth. He had recorded it. It was as clear as it could be. That it was the Violectia. Entire fleets were sent to check it, but again, nothing. According to her calculations, the Violectia had been there for three cycles before disappearing again. People were afraid to look up. Afraid of looking up and seeing the Violectia, but some still did. Fools! If only they hadn't. The Violectia wasn't the only one that appeared. Twenty-three cycles later, Andromeda appeared between two galaxies so close that it should have collided with them, but didn't. Andromeda was there for two cycles, enough to not collide and enough to scare everyone in the universe. Everyone was an edge. The intergalactic community stopped all current conflicts. It was the closest the universe was to universal peace. A shame that it wouldn't last considering who they were up against. The intergalactic community maintained constant communication with everyone. Every minor blink of a tiny star was met with a fraction of a full armada appearing armed to the maximum degree. Then it happened. All the lost galaxies appeared at once, all of them close to the galaxies of the Xenos that sent their armadas to the Violectia the first time. And then, as soon as they came, they left. The humans were back and they were mocking them. Mass suicides happened. Entire governments fell. But the newly formed absolute government of the intergalactic community actually managed to maintain order. The Agak wouldn't give up just yet. They just needed more time. The Agak sent their best scientists to the center of the universe. There, guarded by natural defenses and a third of their full armada, they were researching what happened to the humans. Twenty-three cycles later, it started. Communication lost with 138 galaxies at the edge of the universe. No traces, but neighboring galaxies saw, among others, that one and only Violectia. More information from the scientists at the center of the universe, but less allies to fight the humans. Sixteen cycles later, it continued. Communication lost with 245 galaxies. Again, no traces. The Agak ordered a full retreat of the entire armada, all sent to protect the center of the universe. Nine cycles later, it was worse. 365 galaxies lost. The Agak, or rather what was left of it, moved to the center of the universe with their scientists. Three cycles later, it finally happened. The Agak finally found the answer, but it wasn't thanks to the scientists. It was the members of the armada, the ones that found it out first. Their eyes saw the Violectia, what it had become, and what a magnificent and terrifying view it was. Eight seconds later, the scientists of the Agak, or rather, what was left of non-human sentient life in the universe, finally found an answer. But without anyone else to communicate it to, the message was only received by the humans. The humans turned the Violectia into their flagship, and the other galaxies have been turned into human vessels. There is no escape. Three seconds later, it didn't even matter. End of story. Story number two. Bringing in the big guns, written by Ryan Hundert. It has become somewhat of a common sense that advancement in technology leads to miniaturization in equipment sizes, be it in telecommunications, computing, or weaponry. The Rantus, for example, has miniaturized their computing devices to the point that their common handheld devices are comparable to most supercomputers of their rival species. The Gerwin biggest battleships are the size of Anjari corvettes, manned with only three crew, yet still packed with enough firepower to demolish a large city in a single volley. Anjari interstellar telecommunications arrays are integrated within their, and some other species, common household devices. The marvel of miniaturization enables most species to focus on the aesthetic aspect of their tech, because they don't have to worry about the space to put their equipment. Indari Collective even forgone their physical bodies entirely, allowing them to stay within their home system 
and preserving its pristine condition, despite having a third largest population size in the galaxy. Humanity, however, hasn't exactly caught up with this trend. As their technology advances, the larger and uglier their spaceships seem to become. Sure, their telecommunications arrays are as miniaturized, but their weapons surely haven't shrunk even a little bit. If anything, it slowly grows bigger by the years. Take the prize Metsu class battleship, for example. Seven kilometers long spaceship with basically a single greatest cannon in the galaxy had ever seen. The spine mounted artillery took almost half of the ship length, accelerating a neutronium round a hundred meters in diameter to a whopping five percent of the speed of light. The main targeting computer was a giant supercomputer composed of 6,000 quantum computing cores, ensuring perfect hit by the main gun. The crew quarter has enough space to hold an invasion army for an entire planet. And their power core has enough power to somehow drive another thousand of point defense and missile launchers, as well as 60 auxiliary two-meter caliber railguns. Yes, meters, not centimeters, as any other sensible race would have used. The ship was so huge that they have to invent a novel propulsion technology just to move the entire thing. Capable of invading an entire system on its own, barring ones controlled by Sei and Jari. Mutsu class battleship, composed of fifths of human fleet. Where did they find the resources to build the entire thing? We might have never known. Perhaps we should ask the eerie silence of their home system. But it gets even better. A completed mecha structure. A colossal shell of negative mass exotic matter encasing an entire star they dubbed Dyson Sphere has been a target of at least 16 interstellar travel incidents in the last year alone due to their extremely low signature, effectively undetected by anything other than hyperspace sensor systems. They used it to power the largest supercomputers, which doesn't even compare to Rantus or Indari Collective ship-level supercomputers, as well as habitats for 13 trillion members of their species. And they have six of them, with more on the way. Of course... Going big alone isn't enough to become the best. Their computer sucks compared to other species. Their weaponry, though surely impressive, can't hold against hard, cold numbers. They had discovered this by the hard way in fighting the Gerwin fleet right after they unveiled their new Mitsu classes. But size does matter, especially when you're planning an interstellar campaign. Why, if it doesn't, would we still be waving Crimson Anjar Federation flags instead of Azure ones? End of story. I just quickly want to thank the Tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gusta, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joachim Bakker.